He was the most humble. He was the most aware. He was the most available. He put most of us who knew him really to shame. He is very kind. He loves everybody. He try to make uh, happiness for every place. He's a sort of man that he loves everybody. And uh, he's an open-minded man. He uh, smiles for every, for every um, single person. He's very simple. He, he simply living, well, I mean, love children. One day I said to Sayyid Mahdi, I said, you know very well that you are in danger from Saddam Hussein and his gangs. Let us arrange some protection for you, some security guards. There are a lot of Islamic fellows, Pakistanis, very good. And when I finished, he turned around to me and grinned and laughed a little. And he said, every night I say to God, I'm under your protection. What shall I tell him now? I've got a security guard instead. <laughs> he was a very good conversationalist in a sense that he listened well. And he accepted your proposals to say, in other words, he knew how to obey so that he could be obeyed. How to follow so that he could be followed. A leader who cannot be replaced. I believe the loss is irreparable. Suffice it to say that when I heard of his death, I wept uncontrollably. I wept as if I had lost my father. Although there isn't much difference between his age and mine. He was 55, I am 51. But I always considered him as a father figure. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين. سيد مهدي was my closest companion. We spent more than forty years together in the way of jihad. ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى ابنتك الصفية الزكية فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا رسول I'm standing on Clapham Common in South London, not far from where Saib Mehdi al-Hakim began his Ahl Bayt Islamic Center. I'd met Saib Mehdi some three years ago. I was becoming more interested in the Islamic way of life, and I found in Saib the perfect teacher, but not just a teacher, a good friend as well. Here in his office, I was able to discuss with him openly and freely the kind of problems that face a man from the Western culture approaching Islam. In 1987, we decided we'd make a film together, a film which would bring the knowledge of Islam to people of all kinds of faiths and beliefs. Sadly, Said was to die before we could produce the film. But I was able to gain one interview with him. And this film contains that interview, along with some of the tributes of many of his friends in London. I began by asking Said, what was the cause of the conflicts and wars in the Middle East? 
I think our situation in Middle East, it has only one problem. If we could solve this problem, I think everything would be all right, either in our area or in other areas of the world, especially in the Western areas. The problem is that we have no real government. All the government that, we, that rule us, it is not our government. Government. We don't, the people, they don't know anything about their government and how they come. Because um, no freedom. In, uh, that that area in Middle East area, uh, and I uh, can say this situation uh, for all the countries of this area doesn't uh, confine one country. Uh, but uh, in Iraq, there is a special uh, situation. So Saddam, he started this war, this war, not Iran. And Saddam, we can say, uh, he's um, with, with Western uh, style of government, not Islamic style of government. Well, I'm not sure whether the people in the West would agree with that view. But why do you say Saddam started the war? Because as you know, after the problem of hostages, in Iran, the uh, government of United States of America uh, did its uh, best to do uh, some uh, problem, problems to the uh, new government of Islamic, in, uh, the new Islamic government of uh, Iran. Uh, and, uh, we, we believe, not only think, we believe that uh, United States uh, urge uh, the government of Iraq, especially Saddam. We, we, in fact, we have no government in Iraq. We have only one ruler. He's, he's Saddam. Uh, urge Saddam. Urge Saddam to uh, start uh, this uh, war. What should the West now do to help the situation? Western country, in fact, always they help the oppressor government and dictator, dictator government, and they don't look to, uh, the, to the people or to, uh, to the men. So I think if they feel, I mean Western, countries, if they feel there is a danger from this area, I think they should help to solve this problem. I mean, dictatorship and uh, try to help the people to uh, establish a national government, not a dictator government. This really raises the question of what is good government. As you know, here in the West, we've got many debates at the moment about what is a good government. How far should a government interfere with the life of people? Should it control economic affairs? Should it control information? How far is it supposed to go in interfering or commenting on the life of other peoples and other nations? In Islam, in the view of Islam, the best government uh, which, uh, if it uh, comes from the uh, from the uh, irada and and and, and at, uh, she's a more irada. Will uh, from the will of people. In fact, there are. I uh, cannot speak Arabic. If you. هنالك. ناحيتان في الحكومة في نظر الإسلام 
From the Islamic perspective, government has two aspects. One relates to the executive side, or rather the social structure of the government, and the other relates to the Sharia or Islamic law. Islam maintains that Sharia or law belongs to God and he alone makes laws for his creation. As regards the executive side, this belongs to the people. Therefore, the government should be elected by them. Accordingly, the ideal government is one which is elected by the people and applies the law of Allah to society. But what you're saying, isn't it rather idealistic? We in the West have found that when governments have become too religious or when they've taken strong religious lines, we found that the people become dissatisfied with that. We found that the government becomes corrupt or that the religion itself is corrupted. In yeah. fact, I think because there is very big differences between Islam and Christianity, Christianity is only uh, some uh, teaching, some uh, moral teachings. It has no law, and we called it Sharia. Uh, but uh, for example, if we, if we ask uh, the leader of the leaders of Christianity religion about the uh, view of Christianity in uh, economic, for example, or uh, about uh, political uh, problems of political uh, things. They, they, have no, they have no answer about this question. They would say, we don't uh, speak about, uh, we should uh, not uh, enter uh, enter uh, in, in the uh, in the world 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 worldly uh, things. Yes. In Islam, there is no difference between this world and uh, and uh, the hereafter, or no difference between the earth or heaven, because in Islam we believe that all things. It, 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 it is created by God, by Allah. So God, he's the ruler of earth, and at the same time, he's the ruler of heaven. Well, most Christians would accept that God rules heaven and God rules earth. So I'm still not quite sure how you see the difference between the religions on this point. Islam believes that religious should be for the human beings. Human beings mean all his activities, either in the office, in the college, in the street, in the house, or in the mosque. So uh, in this case, we can't imagine uh, that uh, the government should be uh, differ from uh, uh, or cut from uh, religion because I, I can't be Muslim in the mosque only in the mosque and in street or in the office or in school or in, uh, college I become something else either I, sh I, sh I be uh, either I have to be Muslim in all my life and all my activities or I leave Islam. This is one of the most essential aspects of Islam for people in the West to understand. It's the love of the Sharia, the law which governs all our activities. But it's more than just the love of the law. It's the love of freedom to enjoy in peace and quiet a lawful life. But what he actually meant by freedom was freedom from evil, freedom from being guided by the evil forces. He always tried to tell us, working with him, to rise above personal prejudices, bias, grudges. And he said, freedom is to break those shackles 
which make us so low in our lives. I think Said Mehdi was a man who had no choice. Once you discover the perfect way of behavior, you have no choice but behaving according to it. So he loved freedom in that. He wanted the freedom of expressing and living that way, the correct path, for the others to know it and for them then to choose. Despite these dire political circumstances which surrounded Said, everyone recognized that in himself he was a totally free man. And he used that freedom, first and foremost, by serving Allah and serving people. I was born in uh, Najaf, the holy city of Iraq, in 1935. And I grew up there, and I studied my uh, uh, religious knowledge in the same city, in Najaf. And I become about 25 years old. I started to work in, uh, uh, in social and political activities. Uh, then my father is the late marriage leader of all the Shia of the world, sent me to Baghdad to be his re representative in religious and political activities. It was in 1964. Then I stayed there till 68 when the Ba'athist government uh, wanted to uh, execute me because my political activities against them. And I believe your family has been subject to a great deal of persecution. Yes. In fact, uh, the persecuted not uh, confined only my family. All the people of Iraq, they are under pressure of the Ba'athist government. In any case, about my family, all the male members of my family, they, they are now prisoner without any certain accuse or, uh, or trial. And uh, 17 members of them uh, were killed by the government. They have no act uh, political activity. Their, only, their uh, activities only as, as a re religious uh, people. But uh, g government want to, want to revenge from uh, me and uh, my two brothers uh, who have uh, their special activities against, against uh, the government. But why is it important for you to become involved in political activities against the Ba'athist regime? Yes, in fact, we believe that uh, uh, it is good for every one to uh, do his best to serve people and to uh, be ag against uh, pressure and uh, and uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, we, we called it in Arabic, Dalim ruler, oppressor ruler. Oppressors. Huh? Oppressor. Oppressor. Yes. Oppressor rule, ruler. So this is our duty to do that. As a religious man or even as a Muslim man, not, it, it is not, not uh, confined only the religious people or religious men. In any case, uh, 
we feel that uh, we do our duty in, uh, uh, and uh, to, uh, to to protect uh, people and uh, uh, especially weakened people. Is this what you are now doing in London? I and I by help of Allah, of God, and uh, some of my friends establish these two organizations in, uh, 18, in 1983. No, the first one, Ahlul Bayt Islamic Center. The second one is World Ahlul Bayt Islamic League. We have weekly activities, uh, especially in uh, Sundays. We invite people together, together for uh, to celebrate in uh, uh, special uh, uh, memories of Islamic memories. Uh, in fact, uh, we try to uh, help them in, especially in their uh, uh, religious needs and uh, uh, educational needs. Uh, and we have about uh, 160 members, uh, members in, uh, uh, worldwide, uh, from Japan till uh, South America. Uh, but uh, still we don't feel that uh, we reach to the level that we wanted, but oh. we'll try to reach this level. Again, uh, in Arabic I can't describe it. <laughs> well, we called, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, he's very generous, yes. um, spending uh, uh, his money for helping other people. I know myself that he gave uh, donation and help to many people, uh, especially in India, in Pakistan. And there is one point, maybe it's different between him and the other, that when he pay any help, he don't care to uh, mention his name. He try to keep him, to keep himself uh, outside. Can I كل الاهتمام للناس المحتاجين فمثلا كنت ارى ان he would care for the needy and the poor for example a lady came to him for financial help to get married although he had never met her before he gave her the money she needed he gave her what he normally gave to his relatives he trusted people he never inquired about their background he used to say, when one gives, Allah gives back to you. If you give one thing, Allah gives you back tenfold. He, he like all the people. For example, he believes in Imam Ali speech. Imam Ali said, the man is of two kinds, either Muslim or non-Muslim. The non-Muslim are a human body like you. So you have to love all the people, either Muslim or not. Sayyid Mahdi believes in this speech, and he works for that, although he's a religious. But he pushed me, he pushed me, and he participated in founding the Organization of Human Rights, which this organization defend the Iraqis irrespective of their religion, means, color, and so on. There was a man who, for the last 20 years, when he was exposed to, to the public at large, was a man of service without a question. I, 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 I came very close to him sometime, and uh, I, feel, I find him is crying uh, for the faith or the fate of uh, his Iraqi people. <laughs> But he was not just gentle and kind. Said was a fighter. He fought his jihad with words, and to be on the receiving end was like being prodded by the sword of Imam Ali. 
he was fighting by the world. He was fighting uh, just to explain our problems in Iraq to uh, everybody who meet, especially those who can uh, who can serve us in this field. He was fighting by giving a lecturer everywhere, as I remember, in Pakistan. This concern for the Iraqi people brought Saeb Mehdi into a direct conflict with the president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein had a very good reason to get rid of him or to liquidate him. The reason is, for the first time, uh, 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 Sayyid Mahdi al-Hakim, and he was only him, was able to gather and unite the different factions of the opposition, the Iraqi opposition to Saddam Hussein. He was able to get them together and they accepted to meet and unify under his guide, guideship. Sayyid certainly saw his struggle with Saddam Hussein as part of a universal jihad. What Imam Hussein said was that it is better to die with honor than to live with disgrace. Now this is a very famous quotation from him. So it is not necessary that a man who tries to follow in the wake of Imam Hussein is always opposing a religious head, any oppressor, any tyrant, any evildoer, whether he is enjoying any authority or not, is expected to be opposed openly. The virtuous must rise to see that the oppressors and the tyrants do not oppress the people. So that is one level. And further up, if there is a ruler, a king or a monarch or even a president of a republic or any set of government, any which is usurping the rights of the people. At that time, a man who wants to follow in the wake of Imam Hussein has to rise to say that what is happening is wrong. So this is why we say that it was not only for Islam that he offered his life. He offered his life for humanity at large. Anyone who stands up against oppression is actually upholding the message of Imam Hussein. This is how it applies today. We should fight when we think that our fighting will achieve benefits for Islam. We believe that when we say Islam means the benefit of human being because we believe that Islam for the benefit, the religion for the benefit of human beings. In this uh, point, I want to explain that the difference between the culture of Western and the culture of Islam in this point, the culture of the, way, uh, of the, of the Western that if someone fight or do his best for the benefit of his people, his nation, he's a good man. Even if, uh, the, uh, the, if uh, his fighting was against the interest of other, another nations. In Islam, it is forbidden to do something to gain benefit for yourself or your nation against the benefit or interest of other nations. You seem to be suggesting that Western countries are only interested in themselves, while Islam is interested in the whole of humanity. But I think people in the West might disagree with that view. They might suggest that you are just interested in the Islamic cause, and that's what you want to impose on everybody else. In fact, we believe, as I said before, that we should 
fight always for the sake of the humanity, of the mankind, uh, without any differences between nation and nation. We don't look at the languages or uh, colors or uh, nations or because we believe that all the human beings are the creature of Allah and they are equals in the view of Allah, in the view of God. So if we see someone, he try to, he tries to uh, oppress people, we should defend from this people. We should fight in the way of these people. But the terrorists argue the same idea. They all say they're fighting against oppression. What's the difference between the terrorists and the ideals which you're talking about? I think in this point there is a difference, very big difference between terrorism and jihad. Jihad means that offering classifies uh, in, in the way of God and weakened people. But terrorism to uh, try to terror people to gain benefit for yourself. So jihad means to give your life to the real owner, to God, because Allah, or God, he is the real owner of your life. And the pleasure of God is to gain benefit for his people. So if you give your life in this way, in the benefit, in the way of benefit of uh, of people, of humanity, you, in this case, you gave your life in the way of God, in the way of the real honor of your life. I don't know if, if I could explain that. This rather reminds me of the story of the um, Im Imam Hussein, and I wonder if you could say something about that. We believe that Imam Hussein, when he Fight, fight it in Karbala, he didn't fight to gain a personal benefit for himself, but he fighted the wrong, the uh, op oppressor. So he believed that his fighting was in the way of Allah, in the way of God, because he wanted to defend from the uh, weakened uh, people. He sacrificed for the sake of people, to gain benefit for people. But what is meant by the sacrifice of life? What's the significance of a man giving up life? Come to that, what are we doing in these earthly bodies anyway, which seem to attract some pleasure? and rather a lot of pain. He, human being, he, he, human being is created not for this world. He is created for another world, another, for, 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 for the here after. And this is the real life of the human being. I would really like to understand this. You seem to be suggesting that this world, the world we live in now, is not a real world. It's a passing world. You're suggesting that the reality is in the hereafter, the world we will move to when we die. This is only as a pass. When, for example, as uh, we spend some time in, 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 the, in the womb world, for example, but that doesn't mean that, wo that world was our real world. It was only as a past. 
we spend some time and we come here. So this period or the time that we spend it in this world, in this world, it is only as a as a time of womb. What then is our duty in this passing world? In this case, we think that if we could serve people, we'll achieve the, a, a good life in, in, in our real life. Now we come back to the meaning which I uh, spoke about it. And if our life was uh, the, re the uh, way to serve people, in this case, we should keep our life to gain a, real, a good life in, in the future. And if our death was the way to serve people, we should uh, try to die to gain the uh, good life in, 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 the, in, the, in the future. I don't know if I could explain. Well, I suppose most people think in this world but what life's all about is having a very good time, making lots of money, marrying a beautiful man or marrying a beautiful woman, and not caring in the least about other people or the world around them. Uh, yes. In fact, in, yes. 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 In fact, they pre prefer the, the world on, on the death and the way of Allah, the way of God. God, yes. It's as as right. usual, as it's usual, same. Yeah, yes, same, same yes, same. <laughs> so does this passing life have any value? We believe that uh, the value of life or death, it is that how you can serve the people. If you can't serve the people by your life, your life it has its special value, and it will be a valuable thing. And if you can help or serve, serve people by death, your death will be, in this case, a valuable thing, and you should do it if you like to uh, get the pleasure of God, of Allah. So, in fact, we look to the life and death as, a, uh, as we look as other creatures of, of Allah, because God created life and also he created death. So he is the owner of our life and our death, death. When we believe that our life serves people, in this case, we believe that our life is very important thing and we should protect this life and keep it and defend any uh, harm uh, harm uh, from it because this life is very important thing because it's to to serve people and this bring the pleasure of of god serving people ple yes. and same time when we believe that death our death will serve the people, in this case, uh, we should uh, we should good welcome the, 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 our death because, in this case, we can uh, gain the pleasure of of God. On the 17th of January, 1988, Saib Mehdi was assassinated in the Sudan. He was there, serving the people of Islam as he always did. And he regarded the people of Islam as being mankind everywhere. He was born near the shrine of Imam Ali in the holy city of Najaf in Iraq. He was born into a family whose lineage is traced back to the holy prophet, may peace be upon him. A family that represents a powerful authority and tradition in Islam a family renowned for its knowledge of theology and jurisprudence, and a family that despite recent persecution will never be silenced. 
Said himself had visited so many countries in the world and lived in many of them as well. He had been a great ambassador of Islam. He brought his warmth and light to many people. Said is now laid to rest in the Matsuma Shrine in Iran. But his spirit lives on, and his light will long be remembered. As I believe that the duty of those who was around Sayyid, Sayyid Mahdi al-Hakim, may Allah bless his soul, is to follow his idea, and it was very simple thing, just to be a united, just to be uh, a gathering and work together. And really, it is not easy. By word, it's easy, but by practice, it's not easy. He was trying a lot when he was in his life uh, to make us uh, as unity as he can. And he, uh, success, success in his idea. But we hope to follow his idea, to be a unit. And there is other things to be, to love each other. And this is the one of his personality. He was loved. He was loving every person who was uh, dealing with him. So to love each other, to be a unit, as I think it is the first duty of us. Anyone who, any Muslim who dies for Islam, dies in the way of Allah. So he's a martyr. There's no doubt about it. Islam would accept him as one of the martyrs. He is very strong to fight. He, is, he likes to fight up to the end of his. Uh, we always saying that, look, Said, you are very weak. You got your heart, uh, probably got your heart operation, and uh, um, you are. Uh, you, you got to take rest. He never say that. I will, you know, take a rest. I have to fight until uh, what's so called in Islam shahada. <laughs> spend a very nice time with him uh, from, from a point of view that from uh, is humorous really although he's a, an, a leader but I don't forget his humorous uh, behavior anyway he was a man of tremendous uh, uh, jovial spirit and a man who loved human beings and he was so tender and nice. Allahu Akbar, Sakrullah Arabi Wadi. Allahu Akbar. He was brought up in the most perfect, if you like, Islamic environment. He had the aptitude for it too. And his life naturally showed that he lived it fully and he exuded it and he transmitted it in every breath of his life. He was a man of perpetual awareness. He was a man of spontaneous, if you like, remembrance. He had death in front of him, and therefore he lived fully. The great quality of Sayyid Mahdi uh, the love, he was love, everybody, 
Muslims or non-Muslims, just for human being. Because this life is very important thing, because it's to to serve people and this bring the pleasure of of God, serving people, play, yeah. and same time when we believe that death, our death will serve the people. In this case. Uh, we should uh, we should good welcome the, 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 our death because in this case we can uh, gain the pleasure of of God. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون